Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for that rather scary introduction. Um, it's been a huge honor to be here for the last few days. It's the first time in Maine, and I've just loved talking to all the people, uh, the faculty and students uh, from the Mitchell Center and from around the campus who've given me such inspiration about the work that you're doing here. And I think it's a really trailblazing uh, university that I've, I've never seen anything quite so dynamically kind of um, cutting edge science, but also partnerships, also reaching out to communities and hugely interdisciplinary. And I just congratulate you all and, and David for such an inspirational uh, center. Thank you. Right, so this is a kind of um, scary title. Um, and I hope I'm gonna give you a little bit of an optimistic vision for something that looks quite challenging. I thought the first thing I ought to do was to explain to you what I might mean by sustainable, wild, and socially just. And um, this is quite a simple way of thinking about it, but it's quite a nice uh, kind of diagram that explains something of what we mean. This is something that was done by someone called Kate Raworth, and she calls it donut economics for obvious reasons. Um, so the idea is that uh, in order for the social justice to happen, we need to have people, um, everyone in the planet, to be above a foundation of basic social uh, needs. And you can see a list of things like education, energy, peace, that kind of thing. But we also need not to exploit our planet beyond its limits. So there's a limit beyond which, a ceiling beyond which we shouldn't be exploiting our planet. And the safe space for humans is between those two, between the floor of social need and the, and the ceiling of uh, ecological sustainability. And she did a little quick analysis of where we were, and the red is... Um, where we haven't quite made it on the planet in terms of the social side going inwards, and the red going outwards is where we haven't quite made it on the ecological side. And you can see uh, we're not doing so well. So as a conservationist, I work on um, biodiversity and uh, land conversion. So my area of interest is, is down the bottom of the, of the donut, but I'm aware that there's the climate change pollution part of it as well, that all needs to be integrated. So I have been a professional conservationist, I guess, for 30 years. Uh, I'm going to confess that I started as an undergraduate in 1985. Um, and since then, things haven't really got better for uh, nature. So that's a bit of a fail. Um, so this is the Living Planet Index you're seeing here, which is a compilation done by WWF every year, which is the number of vertebrate individuals in the, in the world. And you can see that since 1970, we've had just fewer and fewer wild animals in this planet. And in fact, since 1985, we've uh, lost about 30% of the actual individual wild animals in this, in this world. If you look at from where I am, and, and this is pretty similar to where you are, uh, basic kind of common species have declined quite dramatically. Like this is the common farmland bird index. We've got uh, very large declines there. Um, We've also had extinctions. So since I graduated, nine bird, bird species have been declared extinct. Uh, the bramble key melanis, little mouse, is the uh, first documented uh, victim of climate change. It was on a little island off Australia and, um, and didn't make it. And I'll just give you a little sound here. I don't know how many of you know what this is. This is the Yaxi River Dolphin, or the Baiji, uh, which is extinct on the planet, but you can still find it on the internet. So there you go, it's still alive. Um, and so we have a prevailing narrative, I guess, uh, about the state of nature that talks about the fact that wild nature is declining, uh, it's too little too late, nothing's happening, um, and it's a sense of gloom and hopelessness. Okay, so where is the optimistic vision, you ask yourselves? So there has been movement at the international level in terms of trying to combat some of these issues. And um, in the last few years, we've had quite a lot of uh, international policy made. So for example, in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. We also had the Sustainable Development Goals that set a set of targets about how to make um, humanity get on a sustainable path to do with both poverty and um, nature. And the longest running one is the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was signed in 1992. But in 2010, there was a set of targets called the HE targets that were all agreed by many, many countries. Um, 
that give quite rigorous uh, targets that we should all live up to to try to improve nature. Maybe those targets didn't go far enough, but at least they were signed off on. The interesting thing about the Aichi targets is that we're now 10 years on, and the plan is going to be up for renewal in 2020, and there's a lot of busyness going on in the international community about how we're going to have a next generation of, um, of targets while realizing that we haven't really made it on the first set. So um, there's quite clear evidence when you look at the indicators and the targets that biodiversity has not been getting better. If you look at the threats, the drivers that underlie these downward trends in nature, it's quite interesting to see that um, the largest ones are over-harvesting over and agricultural activity. The agricultural activity is uh, land destruction, and a lot of it is for, for livestock, for, for our food. The over-harvesting, a lot of it is timber. There's a lot of very complicated drivers, but what you can notice is that they are interacting things that happen on a range of scales. So when we think about how we're going to uh, address these drivers of change and make a difference, we need to think on three scales. We need to think on the planetary scale, the macro scale, a large scale. We need to think at the, at the meso scale, so landscapes, nations, that kind of thing. And we also need to think at the micro scale about the individual decisions that people make that cause those drivers of change. And if we're going to have any way of solving these problems, we need to think at all three scales and show how these scales interact. If you go to any given place, then, of course, these drivers interact in complicated ways within that place. So these are some pictures from one of my research sites, which is in uh, southern uh, Cambodia. And what we've got here is a beautiful protected area with some wonderful wildlife, which is being encroached for uh, commercial crops, for sale, for subsistence hunting. It's also got a very large road, rosewood trade, where they're extracting uh, timber and taking it out. It's also local consumption for bushmeat and harvesting of plants for sale and for bushmeat. And so in any one place, you have to deal with large-scale drivers of uh, international trade in timber and in uh, agricultural commodities and small-scale drivers of people eating meat uh, around the park. So what's a conservation scientist to do? This is a group of my students and, and uh, doctoral researchers, and here we are standing around trying to look happy, thinking about how we, as a group of academic scientists, going to make a difference. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from our work that hope will illustrate for you the, the approach that we've taken. It's actually very similar to the approach of the Mitchell Center, which is heartening. And, um, some of the things that we've managed to achieve and not achieve um, using that approach. The first one's about uh, reducing illegal behavior in Uganda's national parks, which was led by Henry Travers. So this is something that was a, um, a collaboration with us as researchers, but also a couple of NGOs, and also very importantly, as you will see, the Uganda Wildlife Department. So if we think about it in terms of these different levels of drivers, our problem is concern about this large-scale poaching in the national parks. The macro-scale drivers is, uh, for certainly for some of that poaching, is um, demand for things like ivory in nations far away from Uganda. At the MISO level, what we have is large-scale rural poverty, but also we have uh, the way in which the park guards actually deal with that poverty um, in terms of uh, antagonism and conflict with the local people. And then at the micro scale, you have individual households, individual people deciding how to get the income and the food that will feed their family. Am I going to farm or am I going to go hunting? What balance between those two do I have? I said that at the meso scale, there's this conflict. And that conflict is partly because um, the people who bear the costs of national parks live, are the ones who live right on the border. And so here we have a picture of some children who are guarding their family's crops rather than going to school. And we also have a picture of people who've just been trained as law enforcement guards. So what we found in these parks is that over the years, there's been a huge breakdown of trust, that local people are seeing things not changing for them, they're seeing costs and no benefits. And the, the Wildlife Authority's response has been to train more people with more rifles to go out and try to enforce the protected area. And that isn't working. So we came in, we were asked in, and we followed a kind of adaptive management cycle in trying to address this problem. The first thing we did was to try to understand the problem, trying to understand who was poaching and 
uh, what the kind of characteristics these people were through various different methods. Then we started to ask about what the motivations were for that. What are the underlying reasons why people are out there doing these things? Then we can start to ask both them and the park managers what kind of solutions they might see might work for the future. And we can use interviews, but we can also use kind of econometric methods to do that. Once we've thought forward about ways in which things might change, we can support the, gov the, gov the government and the local communities to implement those approaches. And importantly, the circle goes round. You don't stop there. You then keep looking and, and planning and understanding as you go round and round the circle to try to make things better. So the first question was how much illegal activity actually is there? We have concern, but that doesn't mean it's, it's actually a problem. Uh, well, sadly, it was a problem. So this is uh, results from a indirect questioning method that meant that people were able to be truthful without incriminating themselves, which meant that we got better estimates than you usually get by just asking people directly. What you see here is that the main threat is um, commercial hunting of meat for sale and ivory and things like that in some places. And 40% of our households said that they had hunted commercially for sale um, in the last year. So no wonder there's a problem. When asked why they were more likely to hunt illegally, and when we did our, our statistics, we found a few things. So the first thing is that we often have the narrative that says that poor people hunt because they need to hunt. Actually, it was the opposite in this case, that it was better off households that were hunting. The question is, is, are they better off because they've hunted and it's made them better off? Or are they able to hunt because they're better off and they're able to afford the guns and things? And it's both directions, I think. The other things were, were perhaps more obvious, which is that the ones who were out there hunting were people who felt that they had lost out from the park. They suffered crop raiding or predation, and therefore they, they were getting stuff back. And the other thing was that in Uganda, when you have tourists going to a park, a proportion of the fee from that tourist goes back to the communities, and that's called revenue sharing. And that's supposed to be the way that the communities are made to feel happy about the protected area. Unfortunately, it just makes things worse because you get all sorts of conflicts about the revenue sharing, and it's not fairly shared, and people feel they've lost out, and they get re resentful. So the conservation kind of intervention is actually making things worse. So those were the things that our statistical models found. But also, when we talked to hunters, we talked to them in prisons, we talked to them in their homes, um, they were more clear about their motivations. It was about, this is an easy way to earn money. And that was really the main message that came. We then did a lot of these scenarios and experimental methods to try to understand which approaches to solutions might be best preferred. And we took a few solutions that are things that were brought up by the wildlife authorities or by the local people as possible. The first one was mitigating human wildlife conflict. So the picture here is uh, people digging a trench to stop elephants getting across into, um, into the cropland. The second one is social enterprises, things like beekeeping, things that are other livelihoods that people could, um, could engage in that would give them money. The third one is employing local community members as eco-guards to act as a bridge between the wildlife authority guards and the local communities. One was law enforcement. That's the thing that the Wildlife Authority are doing. That's what they want to do. But we're interested to see if the local communities liked it too. And finally, and this is a caveat, a kind of a cautionary tale about what happens when you sit in your desk at Oxford and think up solutions. You just think, wouldn't it be cool that you know, there are already zones where people are allowed to harvest honey and fuel? Wouldn't it be cool if they could be allowed to harvest meat there too, because meat's what they want? Uh, so we thought we'd try and see if there was legal hunting in the zones, in the buffer zones, whether that would be liked. So this is responses from the Wildlife Authority in green and the local people in orange. And you can see that both the local people and the Wildlife Authority liked the positive incentive ones. They liked the human wildlife conflict, the social enterprises, and the eco-guards. Interestingly, and perhaps against expectation, although the Wildlife Authorities liked legal uh, le uh, law enforcement, the local communities liked it too. They recognized that this is a protected area that was their heritage and that the animals within it needed protection. So they were OK about that. Neither of them liked our idea of legal hunting. So that one was out of the window. In order to be sustainable, you have to have things that people think are fair and legitimate. If they're not thought as fair and legitimate, then they're not going to be abided by in the long term, and it won't be sustainable, even if in the short run it works. So we asked local people about which of the solutions they felt were fair. And again, the three um, positive incentive ones were felt to be fair, 
and legal hunting they were a bit dubious about. How about behaviour change? Because what we're trying to do here is actually promote behaviour change. We're trying to reduce people's hunting. So one kind of behaviour change is to inform on people who they know are coming in to hunt. And all of them, all of the suggestions we made, people suggested that they would inform more if these were, if these were put in place, including the legal hunting. The $64,000 question is whether they would actually reduce their illegal hunting as opposed to these methods. And, they, and it was seen that the social enterprises, so the things that gave them other livelihoods, and the eco-guards that gave them employment were the things that would most reduce their illegal hunting, mitigating human wildlife conflict a bit, legal hunting, not at all. So we had some answers there from our research. But that that's, that's, doesn't take you very far, because then you have to do something about it. So the way that we did that was because we had a partnership with the government, with the Wildlife Authority, we spent, we spent another three years, so this was three years' work, we spent another three years working with them to produce costed, prioritised action plans that were the Wildlife Department's action plan. It wasn't ours. We helped them, but they wrote the document. And that was about how do you do community-led crime prevention in these parks. Um, and there were three pillars, which was effective relationships, effective law enforcement, and positive incentives. And the picture here is the uh, executive director of the Wildlife Authority, and he's handing over this costed action plan to the head community ranger at Murchison Falls National Park for her to implement it with his blessing. So that was really good. Um, and a further grant, actually, is now helping them to implement that. It's really important that, that the government department itself is on board and, it's, and that they own this stuff. So in this case, what we did was that we did detailed research, long-term de detailed research, with trying to understand individual incentives and why people were hunting. And that allowed us to provide engagement and support for um, these guys to actually change their behavior. Um, and when I say change their behavior, I don't just mean the local people. What I mean more, actually, and completely, is the changing of the behavior of the wildlife authority. So these wildlife authorities have focused so strongly on law enforcement and guns. So in the case of Murchison Falls National Park, 200 people are employed as law enforcement rangers and six people are employed as community rangers engaging with the communities. They have to change that balance. And this action plan required them to change the balance in their budget. That's a very courageous thing to do. Because just think, you're in the eyes of the international NGOs and you're in the eyes of the government. And if you change your budget away from law enforcement towards community rangers and some elephants get killed, all that the people see outside is, well, they reduce the number of guards, and surprise, surprise, the elephants were killed. So it's a, it's a brave thing to do. But we gave them the evidence, we gave them the confidence to do that because we had provided enough evidence that allowed them to think, yes, if we do this, it will actually reduce crime. So that's that one. Now I'm coming to another one. It's very, very different. It happens also to be in Uganda. I don't just work in Uganda, but this is a good example for me. And this is something about infrastructure. So our problem was the value of nature for local people not being accounted for in big infrastructure projects, and importantly, not being accounted for in the biodiversity impact reduction techniques that they're doing. So I'd like to start this case study with probably the most horrifying statistic that I've heard in the last couple of years, which is that 70% of the infrastructure in the world, by which I mean roads, railways, mines, towns, all that stuff, 70% of the infrastructure in the world that we will have in 2050, that we know already is going to be built in 2050, has not yet been built. That's quite something, isn't it? That's quite scary, but it's an opportunity too. So some of that is to do with the Belt and Road Initiative from China, but not all of it. So if we think about infrastructure, that is fundamental to a nation's development. People need electricity. People need roads. They need railways. So we can't just say no infrastructure. What we have to say is, can we do infrastructure in a way that's better? It's better for local people, and it's better for biodiversity. So the macro drivers for this particular problem I'm talking about was this large-scale investment in infrastructure. The meso drivers in this case was a dam, a hydropower dam on uh, the Nile River by Lake Victoria that was flooding farmland, flooding uh, natural areas, and that was also displacing people. And then the micro drivers for this issue 
well, in fact, it was, it was not so much the local people's behavior, it was the local people being put upon, a feeling that the local people were not benefiting. So when we do infrastructure, trade-offs are inevitable. And those trade-offs happen across those three scales that I talked about. So we need our national level development priorities. They need to trade off, and they are traded off, against local, national, and global biodiversity values. So we need to decide how we're going to balance those two. The thing that's a little bit less thought about is local people's needs and aspirations. And they're also traded off, both against development and against biodiversity. So when we're thinking about the biodiversity development trade-off, and that's better established in the literature, people use a thing called mitigation hierarchy towards no net loss of biodiversity. So that's a bit of a technical mouthful. But what it means is that when you put something in, a, in place, like a mine or a railway or something, you're going to cause some biodiversity damage. You can, you can predict what damage you're going to cause. No net loss of biodiversity means that by the end of the infrastructure project, you should end up with the same on average, net amount of biodiversity as you started with. So how do you do that? You follow this hierarchy. The first thing you need to do is try to avoid the most precious and valuable biodiversity. So you don't put your mind in the most precious and valuable place. Once you have done the best to avoid it, you'll still cause some damage. And then you have to try and minimize the damage you do by doing it in an eco-friendly way, by doing your mine or your dam in a way that, that's kind of trying to minimize damage to salmon runs or whatever it is. And those are both preventative measures. There'll still be some damage. When you've done that, then, you have to try to remediate that damage. After you've finished, you can put the roads, you can kind of put the soil back, you can replant the areas, that kind of stuff. So remediation. There'll still be some damage left. When you've done all of the remediation, then you can offset. So what offsetting is, is that you're, you're improving conservation values elsewhere. You're, you're digging ponds, you're kind of planting meadows, you're, whatever you're doing to try to improve biodiversity elsewhere. And um, those are post hoc compensatory measures. And then what we need to do is if the amount of biodiversity gained or avoided or whatever is the same as the amount of damage, then you can say, I've made it to no net loss. If you've got more at the end, then you've made it to net gain. So if you have a housing development, for example, um, you could do your biodiversity offset, um, and that would be great, but Let's think about the local people. And whatever biodiversity offset you do, um, there are going to be winners and losers amongst the local people. So the people who need housing are going to, be are going to benefit. The long-term residents who get a nice biodiversity area uh, are also going to benefit. The losers are going to be the people who used to use that open space, perhaps for dog walking or sports. And they might be the people who don't like change. So you have to think about those different groups and try to make sure that each of those groups uh, come with get some kind of benefit. OK, so that's a preamble to the project. This is one that was also with a government agency, a different agency this time, which is the National Environment Management Authority, uh, who have oversight over the environmental impact of all development. We worked with a local NGO called Nature Uganda. We also worked with some international partners, including business, think tanks, and NGOs. And the researcher was uh, Victoria Griffiths. So we were called in to do this project. We were asked to do it by uh, the local NGOs, and also this particular project, we were asked to do it by the National Environment Management Authority, NEMA, who are project partner in, in country. And the fact that the government agency called us in is important later. Okay, so that's Uganda, and uh, it was just uh, above Ginger on, on the Nile. So the thing that we were asked to evaluate was called the Bujigali Hydropower Project, which was completed in 2012. It was funded by the World Bank. Anything that's funded by the World Bank and international lenders requires environmental and social impact assessment and mitigation to no net loss. So there was a 200-page document that was saying all the things they're going to do. You can see where this is going. Um, for social and environmental impact, which was done in 2012. We came in in 2017, so five years later. Um, one of the big things that it did was it flooded a, a waterfall called Bujigali Falls. And that was important because it was a spiritual site for the local people. And... So it's something that was culturally very important for heritage. What they did, what they promised to do in return, was the Kalagala offset. So it was a little bit further up the river. And the idea was that they would protect the Kalagala Falls and the Atanda rabbits, rab Rapids, shown here. They would develop tourism activities as a way of getting new livelihoods. 
and they would conserve a forest reserve called Mabira Forest Reserve, and that would increase the biodiversity of the area. After we came in, um, the Simba Hydropower project was started. So this is another hydropower project further up the Nile. Um, it's still pretty much there. It's pretty close to, to being finished now. This was rather different because it was funded by the Chinese and the Ugandan government, so there was no legal requirement for uh, environmental and social offsets. And in fact, there was great concern that it was actually flooding part of the Kalagala offset, so actually damaging the previous biodiversity and social mitigation. Okay, so yet again, we went in and did a de detailed uh, study to understand the well-being and environmental impacts of these things. I'm not going to talk about the natural environment impacts that was done by the uh, Ugandan team. I'll talk about the social impacts. So what we've got here is uh, we've got the Nile River flowing, and we went to six villages, uh, one on each side of the Nile, one set in the Bujgali Dam area, one set in the offset area, and one set in the new area with the new Chinese-funded dam. So you don't need to go into the detail. We looked at various different areas of people's well-being. The orange line circles are where people felt they'd lost out. The green is where they felt they had no impact. And the blue, if you can see it, is where they felt positive impact. So what you can see is very small amounts of positive impact on income. The majority of people in the two dam areas felt that they had been uh, negatively affected. And the people in the offset basically felt that nothing had happened correctly. If you think about the rich kind of um, quotes that we found, most of the negative impact was, as we'd expected, livelihood focused. So it was about losing their farmland, use, losing their ability to get money from tourism, uh, and losing fishing uh, in the flooded areas. But there was also quite a strong theme around the cultural heritage and the flooding of the Bujigali spiritual site. Interestingly, we also had all sorts of social, relational, conflictual things that we didn't expect. And I've just put a few up here. So feeling hoodwinked, feeling that the, sh the compensation fund itself brought conflicts between families, that neighbors were displaced and they moved away and they lost their social fabric of their neighbors. And even within their families, that they felt that uh, there was conflict between husband and wife of various kinds. The positives, those very few positives I showed you about, some of them were a a lot of them were aspirational. We recognize that the nation needs electricity. If we have more electrification, the nation will develop, and that will be good for all of us. And then there was a little bit about people using their compensation to buy farmland elsewhere. So as I said, what we found was that the offset was basically a paper offset. Nothing had happened. So what we did then was we used the methods that I mentioned before to, under to try to understand what the people actually wanted the offset to focus on, and we took ideas from the local communities, and we also took ideas from the 200-page management plan that hadn't been implemented, and we asked them about what they'd like to do. Interestingly, in this case, none of them were interested in individual level uh, benefits. They weren't interested in employment for individuals. They weren't interested in individual payments. They were interested in community level benefits. They wanted conservation of their forest reserve because they felt that it brought um, climate stability and ecosystem services. They were interested in community development, like uh, piped water, and they were interested in tree planting. So that's what they wanted the biodiversity offset to focus on. OK, so that was great. And you know, we did a nice bit of research. This was a very controversial project. And I'm quite interested that the government brought us in, particularly that the agency that was supposed to be overseeing all this stuff brought us in. And the World Bank was set to refinance this dam. And they did it, actually, in the third year of our project. They, stood, they did these negotiations. They did refinance the dam. So although I think we can't say that we had any small, any kind of definite impact, what we did do was we allowed our government agency partners to have a set of options, which they knew which the local people wanted. It also allowed our NGO partners to write a letter which was evidence-based, based upon the work that we did together, to the government agency saying, this is what we think you should do as you refinance this dam. This is the way that we could make people's lives better. So I can't say whether that's going to work or not. It was only done in August. What I can say that worked was that we did masses of capacity building at the national level. So uh, government authorities, um, consultants, ecological consultants, NGOs, all really understand no net loss now. They understand how to think about 
uh, gain and losses for biodiversity and for people, and they're much more capacitated now than they were in understanding these issues, which is why they brought us in, I think. The other thing that was cool, and this is a complete opportunity that we didn't expect, was that the government were writing national legislation about biodiversity action, so biodiversity mitigation for infrastructure, and there's lots of new infrastructure coming in in Uganda. What we managed to do, and this is the draft legislation, it's hopefully going to go through, you saw the National Biodiversity Offset Strategy, that's what it was. We introduced the and social. So and social is now in the title and it's in the document so that now whenever people do infrastructure, they can't, by law, ignore local people's concerns. So that was a real unexpected win. And we've also had international uh, guidance and we've trained a lot of people um, in NGOs and governments worldwide about this. So in this case, where we had a problem about value of nature for local people, we did the detailed research uh, at the local level, but the main wins were about engagement and support at the national and international levels, which may or may not feed back to the actual local people on the ground. So what I am trying to say from these two examples, and there are many from the Mitchell Center that would be exactly the same, is that what we want for really high-powered academic research that's going to make a difference in the world is you have to do this detailed bottom-up understanding of the system while bearing in mind the bigger picture, both the academic bigger picture and the real world bigger picture. And you have that interplay between the two that will allow you to make a difference and produce top class research. But kind of spanning that, you need to have engagement and collaboration with NGOs and government partners. And you need to be nimble. You need to be able to, to go around constraints and find and utilize opportunities when they come. The other thing that I think you really, really need is staying power. So these are just some random pictures from uh, a project that's my longest running project, which is now 29 years, which is conserving the saiga antelope in, in uh, Central Asia. And the fact that I've been working there for 25 years as an academic researcher um, and starting to engage in technical advice, in NGOs, in all this stuff, and uh, children's education means that I can now, as an academic, um, take the position as a kind of honest broker, take the position as someone who can be relied upon to provide advice and to support uh, people in any kind of organization who want to do stuff. And so I think this kind of long-term engagement and being trusted and having that independent voice is really helpful. And I actually think the reason why we were brought in in Uganda was we had that external voice. We were able to do that research and to say those things that people internally might find it hard to say. So I think that's a really useful role of an academic. So, to come back to the beginning, um, I said that in 2020, we've got a hugely challenging and exciting year to come when all these international agreements are going to be renegotiated and we can potentially have a new deal for nature and for people at the global level that will hopefully be signed up to by many nations. So, that's starting and, uh, you know, we've got a process towards it, but our ambition at the moment perhaps is weak. So, at the moment, you know, we're not quite sure the extent to which we're going to do something that's really good, that's really new, that's actually going to change those uh, trajectories that I showed you at the beginning, the downward trajectories for nature. I find this a very interesting graph about, uh, which tells me, which is, is kind of reflects social change. It reflects the process of social change. So as a conservationist who spent 30 years banging my head against a brick wall, perhaps, um, it may feel like conservation isn't going anywhere, that we're kind of walking through treacle and nothing's really changing, or certainly not as fast as people might want it to change. But we have to recognize that the way that people change their minds is that you have this great long period of stasis when things are happening, but we can't really see it. And then you get a flip when suddenly society changes. So this graph shows over the years, a long period from um, 1787 to 2015. Um, so you have to take the long view on these things. Um, the number of states with legislation about various different policies. And what you can see is that you get long periods when nothing happens, and then you get states, large numbers of states taking it up, and then it goes, it goes federal. So that's the way that society changes its mind. And that's why we as conservationists or as sustainability scientists have to keep on walking through that treacle, because suddenly the treacle is going to turn. And do we think that in conservation this is happening? Do we think that in climate this is happening? Uh, maybe. So a year ago, a 15-year-old girl sat outside a parliament building on her own. 
Um, a year later, uh, this is the number of school children. So we've got New York, we've got New Zealand, we've got South Africa, we've got India, we've even got people marching in Afghanistan for climate. Um, and so that is, that is quite different. I'm not saying that we're there. I'm saying that social change does happen. So as David said, I founded the Conservation Optimism Movement about two or three years ago. And that was partly in response to the fact that it's very hard to be in a profession where uh, you get up every morning and you see things getting a bit worse. Not always, but you know, certainly on a global scale. And actually that's not true. Actually there are many successes at local levels often. There are many things that are going right. And compared to how it would have been if there hadn't been conservationists getting up every morning, uh, we're a whole lot better off. So the conservation movement is trying to bring together people to help people to feel that that's the way forward. So conservationists are able to feel that there are other people on their side, there are other people doing the same thing who are also walking through treacle and for whom, um, and really I started this movement and the amount of uh, need and appetite for it was extraordinary within the conservation world. It needs to be more than that though. We can't just have conservationists feeling good about themselves and empowered. We have to have the whole of society wanting to save nature, wanting to have a sustainable, socially just and wild society. You might not, you might guess that this is a random selection of my family who've been press ganged uh, into pretending that they're conservationists. No, but the point is that um, it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in, we can all play a part. You know, we can all feel like, uh, you know, we can do our bit to save nature. And so, I think the other thing to think about is, can we take that mitigation hierarchy that I showed you for infrastructure, and can we think about it in all aspects of our daily lives? So can we, uh, can we avoid impact? Can we minimize our impact? Can we remediate and can we offset? I've done it with four R's there in a way that is a little bit nicer than the language I just used. But um, you know, there are ways that individuals can make a difference. So I hope that I've given you an optimistic vision for a sustainable socially just and wild world, and thank you for listening. So we have time for some uh, questions and answer. Um, and I think we have people with microphones uh, that, so if you'll raise your hand, uh, there are a couple folks here, looks like Sam's one of them, um, and they'll come to you with a microphone because this is going to end up being recorded. Thank you. Oh, way back, I think. Okay, there you go. Hard to see up here. Um, hi. Uh, do industries such as U.S. fossil fuel companies who've disregarded environmental legislation uh, like the Clean Air Act pose a threat to conservation and climate policy? So, just repeat. Yeah, can you repeat that? Uh, do industries such as the U.S. fossil fuel companies who've disregarded environmental legislation like the Clean Air Act pose a threat to conservation and or climate policy? Well, I can't talk about your country, but I think... <laughs> Anyone who uh, disregards legislation is potentially a threat, environmental legislation is potentially um, posing a threat to the environment. Um, I guess one thing I would say is that um, you always have to have a kind of trade off or a kind of balance between the hard threat and the societal change so, and the more kind of soft ways of thinking about things. So, so, for example, with company, I've worked with a lot of companies, and what you need to do is pick out the best practice leaders in those, in those sectors. You can work with them. They can put pressure on government. They want a level playing field. They can help to bring that playing field up. Um, so if you can get change from within um, and not see them as, see a fossil fuel company as one big entity, but as a collection of individuals, then I think maybe you can have a little bit more traction. Yes, I'd like to ask um, 
uh, what your um, impression or feedback is from the communities that you go out and meet and uh, do they think of themselves first off as living in a country in a s state or a, a town or or do they think of themselves living you know in a geographic area so to speak and and I guess the idea I kind of float is that uh, there are all these efforts to um, get people to identify themselves is there a place to have some type of world address or a local address um, that can help them claim ownership locally that might be nature-based or, or geographic-based? So I think every individual belongs to a range of different groups. Some of them are place-based, some of them are interest-based, some of them are demographic. So, so what we tend to find, obviously it's very context-dependent, but of course you have to recognize that because people belong to different types of group, and every individual has several groups, um, we need to think about it in, in a more kind of nuanced way, I guess. So I wouldn't just talk about, in fact, I don't really like using the word community too much because it kind of implies a community, and that's often not the case. You have people who are living geographically, but people will have different interests and different, and particularly gender, they're quite strong gender differences that are often not taken up, and strong, quite strong age differences, that generational differences are important. So the way that we thought about this, because we have to give best guidance practice, best practice guidance to governments and companies about how do you actually go in and try to understand the costs and benefits that you're giving to communities or people or whatever, you need to think about where the fault lines are. So who are the, where are the big differences between the winners and the losers? Is it a fault line that's a geographical one, so between villages? Is it a fault line between age groups? Or is it between livelihood groups? Once you've found those differences, then you can start to try and balance them between those things. So I would say that you would, you would always have a, a set of potential fault lines you would look for. One would be geographical, one would be the other ones I've spoken about. And then you'd see which in a particular case makes a big difference in this instance. Time for one last question. First of all, Kwe, Guano Day, Chkwabanaki Eg Banawebskeg, welcome to uh, the Wabanaki territory, home of the Penobscot people. And uh, Kachiwili, one thank you for your presentation. I work with um, organizations, both nationally and internationally, on conservation and climate change issues um, with the Post Carbon Institute, um, Drawdown Team, Neotero. Uh, looking at everything from climate solutions to uh, conservation issues and indigenous land guardianship um, issues around the world. And I think that it's a, a, there's a growing awareness that the connection between indigenous territorial rights and the protection of the environment are inextricably connected. And so my question to you is, as you're doing this work around the world, because uh, one of the things that I've been doing is doing a lot of training with these folks on the front lines on decolonizing their practices because the um, the move is is generally to move them into the marketplace and to move them into the marketplace in a way that they uh, those who are moving them feel is best suited for the homogenization of the world in regard to conservation and uh, climate change. Uh, have you given any thought to how do you create um, a space for allowing a different way of being in relationship to life, a different way of thinking about value structures away from an economy, and um, the incorporation of indigenous knowledge as it is into the frameworks that you're using as one of the best practices today for climate change and conservation. So thank you for the welcome, and uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, thank you for the really insightful question. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. And I think one of the real issues with these global level conventions and global level targets is that they completely miss the local, the indigenous, the traditional ways of thinking, the cultural value. And um, those perspectives and voices are completely cut out at the global level. So a lot of the things that we need to do as kind of global conservationists, if you like, is to find ways to make sure that the kinds of targets, the kinds of um, mindsets that we have are broadened 
and that we don't have simplistic solutions that are one size fits all that are done at the global level. I think that's absolutely critical. And that the relationship that people have with the land and the way in which they treat their land is properly recognized. And I don't, I don't mean monetarily recognized in any way. I mean properly recognized as legitimate and part of the solution for the planet. And so um, I feel like that set of voices is something that everyone, that is being actually quite threatened at the moment in the global discourse. I think it's a set of voices that are really being drowned out in some of the, the tropes that are going around global conservation in a rather scary way. So I completely share your concern. I'm not sure that I have a clear solution to it. I'm sure you have um, ideas, but I, I recognize that that's a huge issue that we should all actually, every single one of us should combat it whenever we see it. Yeah. So um, there's going to be a reception afterwards. I wouldn't be surprised that lots of people would like to talk to EJ. For now, we're going to have to draw this to a close with a gift. And it's meant to be a gift. Uh, uh, about optimism, and but I have to tell you a quick story. So uh, I took EJ for a uh, hike up to a mountain to look over Penobscot Bay and then along the shore. And along the shore was strewn with uh, the um, blue mussel, middle of And um, um, But I promised EJ that we would also see a bald eagle, which is always a little bit of a question. And I was getting kind of nervous about it. And within a few minutes after we were on the shore, a bald eagle flew over. Uh, carrying uh, not a fish and almost certainly not a mussel, um, probably a small mammal. Um, uh, and we have a wonderful, but there's a connection here that I uh, have to put on my ecologist hat to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, not everybody thinks that blue mussels are, uh, which by the way, this is a, a mussel shell platter from Edgecombe Potters, Maine's uh, largest American craft gallery. Um, these are pretty special. Um, but not everybody feels optimistic when they think of a, a mussel. Now, I happen to love benthic invertebrates, so I get super excited, but maybe you don't. Um, in any case, uh, I don't think I've never seen an eagle uh, carry a mussel in its talons. Um, I'm not saying they wouldn't do it, uh, but they certainly like eider ducks, and eider ducks love mussels, and so we've got a connection there. <laughs> but here's the thing. The eagle goes by, and you guys probably all know this, but I don't think EJ does. So. One of America's greatest conservation success stories is the fact that right here in Maine in 1967, we were down to 27 breeding pairs of eagles and only four eaglets pledged that year. This year, over 700 pairs and just across the river from where I live along the Penobscot, a beautiful, special place, uh, was an, a nest where two eaglets fledged from that nest alone and I got to know the juveniles this summer, which was very wonderful. So. When you think about your muscle <laughs> gift, <laughs> think about the eagles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's time to turn things over to President Joan for any Monday. Even though she's been here for less than a year and a half, the university and the state are already benefiting tremendously from her vision, her passion, and her dedication. So please join me in welcoming her. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's my great honor to introduce Senator George J. Mitchell. I also, though, first would like to, um, to thank Professor Milner Gullen for an inspiring and fascinating and terrific talk. Let's thank her one more time. Very, very useful. And we always look forward to Senator Mitchell's visits. We're delighted that your stay on the tarmac in LaGuardia was relatively brief, all things considered, today. And so thank you for making it here. Senator Mitchell grew up in Maine, born in Waterville. Uh, one of his several books, uh, his memoir, The Negotiator, uh, tells the story of his roots in Maine. It's fascinating, a terrific, a terrific way to understand the senator and his experience. He's a Bowdoin College alum, 
that's okay. We'll, we'll uh, take that. Served as a U.S. Senator from 1980 until 1995, the U.S. Senator from Maine. Um, U.S. Special Envoy, Envoy for Northern Ireland and the architect of the Good Friday Agreement. An incredibly distinguished career as a statesperson, as an international leader, and as a person who has been very generous with his time and intellect and resources to the state of Maine. In particular, his... Um, his uh, center here, the Mitchell Center. Um, you see its importance to us at, as the university, at the university, to the state, to the nation. The list of sponsors alone for this lecture is emblematic of the interdisciplinarity that is inherent in this center and that is really a model of convergence and leadership and making change um, for our world. Uh, Senator Mitchell uh, also visits us when the Mitchell Scholars come together in the, in the summer. And last year, I had the good fortune of meeting him for the first time there. And he very seriously took me aside and said, one thing I ask of you, make sure you check in on these scholars. Make sure you talk to them. Find out how it's going. And indeed, I did that. And um, another terrific um, benefit for the state of Maine, for our students, for the future uh, of, our, of our state and our nation. So. Um, I, again, uh, thank Senator Mitchell for his generosity, for being here for this important lecture, for helping us to think about the ways in which today's complex challenges, tomorrow's complex challenges, require solutions that promote um, engagement of people from a variety of backgrounds, from a variety of stakeholder positions, and that depend upon respect and mutual understanding and uh, conversation to move us forward. Senator Mitchell, welcome. Well, thank you very much, uh, President Farini Mundi, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence today and for your warm reception. It is true that I went to Bowdoin, <laughs> but whenever I come here, I always point out that I, my brother and sister are graduates of the University of Maine at Orono, and so they are the, uh, they keep us they keep us all very much well informed of what's happening here. Uh, it's been about a year since uh, President Freeney Mundy joined us, placing Sue Hunter, a great president, and you're doing a great job yourself, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. On a personal note, it's a sad day for me because it was exactly a year ago uh, that I was in Bangor to deliver the eulogy uh, for Tom Walsh, a great uh, citizen of the Bangor Brewer area, one of my close personal friends. And I ask you to join me in just a few moments of silence uh, in memory of a great Maine citizen. Uh, I want to express my thanks to David Hart, who continues to do such an outstanding job uh, at the Center for Sustainability Solutions, to the staff of the center, and to the many students and faculty at the university here who are helping to advance the important work of the center. I also thank the many generous co-sponsors of this lecture, and it was especially enjoyable to hear our guest, E.J., talk about the great work she and her colleagues are doing uh, on innovative collaboration. It's encouraging to learn about their commitment to addressing the challenges of sustainable development and the creative solutions that they're developing to these interconnected economic, social, and environmental problems. I think her talk placed in context as well as any speaker, I've heard uh, the nature of these problems, that they cannot be seen or resolved uh, in isolation uh, from their surroundings, both human and natural. She focused on issues facing people living halfway around the world. So I'd like to begin with a few comments on the world and the role of our country in it dealing with these and other international challenges, and then 
speak briefly on challenges closer to home here in Maine. I begin by going back in time. The three major land wars that devastated Europe in the 75 years before 1945 are fast fading into history. Few now recall that in World War II alone, 63 million people were killed in a world in which the population was less than a third of what it is today. The relative peace since then is not by chance. It's the product of institutions and alliances created by the Western democracies led by the United States. Those institutions included the United Nations, NATO, the European Union. They are as vital to peace and stability today as they were more than a half century ago. Because despite undeniable progress in much of the world in recent decades, still old social and economic challenges have persisted and new ones have arisen to face us in the 21st century. They include rapid and technological changes, dramatic increases in trade, other changes that have upended long established patterns of work and daily life for billions of people all around the world, leaving behind hundreds of millions who lack the skills needed to succeed in the 21st century. Wealth has been created on a scale without precedent in human history. But a sharp rise in income inequality has concentrated most of that wealth in a very small number of people at the very top, while incomes stagnate or decline for those in what was the broad middle class. Human beings first appeared on Earth about 300,000 years ago. In Africa, not far from the scenes that EJ showed in her slides. But it was not until the early 19th century of our era that the world's population reached one billion. The most recent billion, the seventh, was added in 13 years. Although the rate of growth has slowed, the absolute numbers continue to rise, especially in countries plagued and often devastated by conflict, corruption, poor governance. This has contributed to the largest movement of people across national borders in all history creating immigration crises in every part of the world. And those immigration crises, in turn, create political crises. Climate change threatens heavily populated coastal areas and island nations, generates more and more intense droughts and storms, increases desert lands, decreases arable farmlands, raising the level of food insecurity for millions of people around the world. It is in the self-interest of the United States and the American people to join, indeed given our position as the dominant world power, to lead in dealing with these and other challenges, working with others as appropriate, and in particular, with our democratic allies around the world. While we compete in many ways, we should not think of our allies, in particular our European allies, as adversaries. They are also our partners. And whether in dealing with the challenges I just listed or in confronting competing non-democratic powers, such as China or Russia or Iran, it is in our national interest that we do all we can to help people everywhere 
to be free, democratic, and prosperous. The sustainability challenges we face in Maine are in some ways similar to the larger issues described earlier. The need to improve economic and community well-being while protecting ecosystems on which all life depends is a never-ending struggle at every level. Just think, 150 years ago, many of the forests for which Maine is now famous had been clear-cut, and more timber was being exported from Bangor than from any other region in the world. When I was growing up, the Penobscot River and almost every river in Maine and around the country were so badly polluted with industrial and municipal waste that high among the least desirable places to live were immediately adjacent to rivers. And that's where I grew up, where my family lived right on the banks of the Kennebec River in Waterloo. And I can still remember to this moment the daily sight and the smell of the noxious chemicals discharged from textile and paper mills that lined the river, the water laced with scum, with debris, with logs. The object of everybody who lived near rivers then was to move away from the smelly rivers. Many of you here, students and others, weren't alive back then, so you'd have a hard time imagining how pervasive those problems were and how intractable they seemed at the time. But we've made great progress in addressing these and other difficult problems as a state, as a nation, and in some parts of the world. Bold leadership has come from many, not least from my political mentor and friend, Ed Muskie, rightly hailed by many as the greatest environmental legislator in our nation's history. 30 years ago, while in the Senate, I wrote about several emerging environmental challenges in my book, World on Fire, Saving an Endangered Earth. Strong actions were ultimately taken to address two of the problems that then seemed severe, acid rain and ozone depletion, and conditions in respect to both have dramatically improved. But another of the problems I discussed, climate change, has not seen progress. In fact, it is now much worse. I wrote that book in the hope that it would help galvanize national and international action. But in the case of climate change, I underestimated the resistance that would come from some leaders and some groups who deny science, who oppose the solutions needed to address the problem. And although I share EJ's belief that international treaties are a critical tool for solving many sustainability problems. It is true also that such treaties are often difficult to ratify and to implement. And so we need even more effort and action at local and regional levels to address these challenges. They can help build the foundation for more comprehensive national and international solutions in the future. That's why I also applaud the work EJ and her colleagues are doing to build local capacity for tackling problems of sustainability. As she emphasized, there needs to be much more engagement with communities whose economic and environmental futures are often hanging in the balance. Given the increasingly rapid pace of change in the world, the ability of these individual communities and of societies as a whole, whether a state or a nation, to successfully navigate such transitions will require flexibility, innovation, a willingness to adapt. 
And this process of adaptation can in turn be strengthened by more scientific research and the vital knowledge it produces. As you know, this important challenge also represents an enormous opportunity for institutions of learning like this and other universities. Few other institutions in our or any society are as well equipped to identify the causes and consequences of the problems of sustainability, to anticipate challenges, to seek out opportunities, to fill gaps in information, and ultimately to develop meaningful and lasting solutions. But in a world where facts themselves and knowledge itself are increasingly contested, there is another equally important role that universities can play. They can meet the communities where they are by demonstrating a commitment to learn about community needs and concerns, by listening to people, by building durable partnerships with diverse stakeholders based on a solid foundation of open communication, mutual respect, and trust. Fortunately, some universities have as much capacity for building productive collaborations with communities as they have for generating scientific facts and developing innovative technologies. Where else? outside of this university in our state and in other institutions of higher learning. And you find such a diverse collection of expertise in the social sciences and humanities. You have community psychologists, resource economists, researchers in communication, ethicists, political scientists, historians, and a whole host of others expert in their areas. This is where the work of this Center for Sustainability Solutions comes in. Let me go back to the climate crisis. We're indebted to climate scientists the world over for helping us understand the complex causes and consequences of the problem. But that poses an even more difficult challenge. What are the trade-offs? What are the uncertainties? of different potential solutions. How can we develop a shared commitment to implement the most effective solutions? For example, we know that renewable energy will need to play an increasingly important role everywhere in the world. But it's easier to say that than to do it. To help spur this energy transition, researchers here at our center are analyzing the potential roles that renewable energy can play in creating a green economy. In collaboration with representatives of the public and private sectors, with non-governmental organizations and others, these teams are evaluating ways to balance the environmental, social, and economic trade-offs associated with four different renewable energy technologies solar, wind, tidal, and conventional hydropower. In addition to their diverse analytical skills, these teams are increasingly valued for their ability to bring groups together to find common ground in an increasingly polarized political society. Indeed, the center's growing reputation as a trusted convener, facilitator, and FAIR mediator is an indispensable resource for this university and for this state. As someone who spent much of my life negotiating, I know that these skills can make all the difference in finding the best solutions to complex problems. In closing, I want to commend and echo EJ's optimism. I'm an optimist, too, despite the many challenges we're facing, and I sometimes worry that optimism is in short supply. But I also know that credible optimism requires a delicate balancing act. It calls upon leaders, political, social, educational, and others, 
create an atmosphere in which people believe there can be success in solving their problems without sounding foolish or unrealistic. And I'm particularly optimistic that there are, in this audience and in other parts of this university, more EJs, and somewhere in this state, more Ed Muskies. I'm confident that the experiences they gain in working to develop solutions in collaboration with partners inside and beyond the university can lead to new solutions, new opportunities, and better futures for all of us and for our children. Thank you again for being here, and thank you for your support for this seminar. Although Senator Mitchell, that's a great talk, and thank you so much. Uh, although Senator Mitchell's tight schedule means that he won't have time to take questions, I do want to take a moment to thank him with a gift. It's impossible to express our full appreciation for the support he's provided to the Mitchell Center and to the University of Maine, uh, not to mention the state, the nation, and the world. But I do want to present him with a small gift, this book, Historic Acadia National Park. Uh, Senator Mitchell's connections to Acadia run deep, and his home in Maine is close to the park. Although you may have already heard of this wonderful book, this copy is inscribed by the book's author, Catherine Schmidt, who was a research assistant in the Mitchell Center before she became the director of communications at Maine Sea Grant for many years. And Catherine is now the science communications specialist at the Skutik Institute and an accomplished Maine author. So thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. So just a few closing remarks before uh, anybody who has the time can come join us at a reception. Uh, we're going to have to get much better at working together to tackle the kind of challenges that EJ and Senator Mitchell have described. Um, and one of the places I find uh, the most hope and optimism is in the way that people at this university and in this state are committed to working together. And I think the, uh, if you just look at the materials on the lecture, um, the most amazing thing, and actually President Freeney Monday noticed it, is the list of co-sponsors of the lecture. Just real briefly, Wildlife Fisheries Conservation Biology, Communication and Journalism, Center for Research on Sustainable Forests, School of Economics, Darling Marine Center, Department of Philosophy, Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center, Department of Anthropology Honors, Wabanaki Center, the Ham Campus Activity Fund, the Cultural Affairs Distinguished Lecture Series Fund. I'm almost sure that there have rarely been lectures where such a diverse group have sponsored. And it tells you how much people care, how much they're willing to work together, and how, uh, how special this university really is. Um, uh, I uh, particularly, a few more thanks, particularly appreciated the jazz combo that was playing outside. I love their stuff every year. Thank you, yeah. I, I now have an alto sax in my uh, possession, but I sure can't play like that. Um, the um, uh, Bertie and the Hulk Auditorium staff are just fantastic to work with. And anybody who knows anything about the Mitchell Center knows that none of it would be possible without an amazing staff. Ruth Halsworth and Carol Hamill are just outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, a special thanks to my wonderful colleague, Linda Silka, wherever she is. Um, Linda has, uh, is running the Mitchell Center while I apparently am on sabbatical. I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but <laughs> once I figure it out, I'll let, let you know. Uh, thanks to all of you. I hope you can join us for the reception down in the foyer of the Collins Center out that way and a few steps down the, down the slope. Okay, thanks so much.